Thank you. I, I would have preferred just Joe the engineer from Toronto. It would have been much simpler. And I, I want to start off with this point that, um, um, yes, let's see if this is working. So uh, I am a biomedical engineer by training, and uh, we celebrated 50 years of biomedical engineering in Toronto, our institute. Uh, and you know, it's a great deal of pride that I have in terms of what our profession has accomplished over the last 50 years in medicine. Uh, incredible innovations in terms of diagnostics and therapeutics and the design of facilities and down to the molecular and cellular level. Uh, and you know, are, are there any engineers in the audience? No? Not one engineer in the audience? Engineers to be. Engineers to be, into training. Yep. So, um, you know, it's now a very um, hot profession, according to this uh, survey this year. You can see that's ranked number two. Not long ago, people had no idea what the profession was. And, and all you computer programmers, any computer programmers out there? A few? <laughs> Just James over here. Also, uh, a very hot profession. Um, I, you know, I, I do want to talk about patient self-care, but before that, I, I really need to talk about the sins that we've, we've had over the years in terms of the creation of technology. As much as we've accomplished, we've harmed. And I don't mean uh, just frustrated people in terms of the bad design of technology. We've har harmed patients in the design of technology because a lot of the technologies we've created have elicited errors in the practitioners that caused an infusion to go awry, or for people to make a, a, a mistake in judgment because of, of uh, poor information or lack of information or information that wasn't put into the proper context, or confusion, um, and so on, or cognitive dissonance. So that's, I really want to get to the story about talking about technology more generally and how we have to really change our mindset. What I'm going to show you is a video clip from our labs our usability labs, right in the middle of Toronto Generals, where we bring our clinicians in to test new products, some of them already in the market, some of them in development. And it's pretty shocking what we see every day. These uh, letters and stuff are too small. Yeah. Wow, this took me this long. In real life, I'd be in trouble. I'm just saying, I could have done two paragraphs by now, but um, I'm struggling. I You know, it's, some of it is really embarrassing, quite honestly. Um, some of it that I've been involved in, some of it that I haven't been, but our job is just to do better. Uh, for all the accomplishments we've had, there's still a lot of work to be done, especially in healthcare. And if we can't really provide good tools for our providers, how are we going to expect to provide good tools for patients? And I think, you know, one of the things we've done is we've lost this notion of empathy in design. So the people that I see who are designing technology are too distant from the people who are actually using the technology. I think it's a lot easier to build technologies for yourself when you're building a website, uh, social media and stuff, things that, that, that you can understand that you might even use. But for you to create technologies for people that you perhaps don't understand the context, it's, it's much harder. And we see this every single day in the products that we use at our hospital and, and that our patients are forced to use. And you know, this is a really important issue. These are the top six chronic illnesses, I don't think, uh, certainly in Canada, but worldwide. These are, uh, this consumes 70% of health spending in Canada, and I'm sure it's the same here in Korea. If you add cancer as a chronic illness, this, this will jump to 85% of all spending. And this is the way we spend money in our province in Canada. But again, I'm sure you have similar graphs, and you see the biggest chunk of our spending is on health care, about 40%. And that's growing. And it's growing disproportionately. And you, we call it health care, but really it's sick care. 
what's really health care are these other components of our budget that we're crowding out. Things like education and social services that, that are also contributors to a person's overall health. And we cannot allow this to continue to grow to crowd out all these other important programs. So it's not just you know, this notion of throwing more money at the problem of health care. We really have to live, beyond, uh, live within our means. And you know, this is typically what the trajectory of one's life is, is that they, we might have these acute events occasionally in our lifetime, and then these acute events happen more frequently over time. And really, we want to start eliminating some of these acute events. Uh, what if we could have a situation like this, that the trajectory is lower here, and there's greater supports in, in later life and fewer acute events? And we tend to spend all our money down in this corner where the cost of delivering care is extremely high and the quality of life is very low. And we need to push this up into this quadrant where co the cost of delivery is lower, people might be at home and be able to, to care for themselves in the home. And that's why patient self-care is so important. And I gotta say, you know, we're not doing a fantastic job in Canada. Even something as simple as providing people with their personal health information is, is, is sometimes quite disastrous. This is a woman in Northern Ontario who simply wanted a photocopy of her personal health information and the company that her family doctor was using wanted $600 for it. Even though legally she's, she's uh, entitled to that, but there's labor in, in creating all these photocopies and she's you know, an ill woman and she has lots of records. So this is embarrassing, this is not good. So something as basic as giving someone their personal health information. And uh, actually, Joe, you might recognize this fellow. This is uh, an advocate in, in Boston, uh, e-patient Dave, David DeBroncart. He was in Toronto a few years ago advocating for patients, not just access to their personal health information, but access electronically. He has a simple motto, give me my damn data, because he needs that data in order to care for himself. So this is what I mean about being a little bit more empathetic about the plight of a patient with a chronic illness. And we're, how we're trying to bring empathy back into design is this process. And it's not unlike what Joe Kavidar presented as well. His was sort of uh, horizontal, mine's vertical. But it's the same sort of idea. It starts off with concept design building. It's iterative. We're going back and forth. We're providing evidence. Some of these loops here are, might be a day, might be a week. Other loops might be years. But it is iterative. We try to improve upon uh, every single, in every single iteration. So what we consider evaluation is this usability testing, which we take very seriously. And then the evidence is the pilots and the randomized control trials that we do. Now, usability, oops, let's go back. Usability in human factors has been around for a very long time. And really, it is about our relationship with the system. Now, someone designed this system for these people to uh, create these widgets, but you can see that there is a disconnect, that, that we, the system that's created is beyond their physical capabilities. And this is what we're really talking about when we're talking about human factors, is this mismatch. And it's causing a few problems, as you can see, right? It's beyond their, their abilities, it's beyond the human uh, limits of performance. And it's also causing some, some behavioral problems, right? Anyway, you know how that goes. Um, and so I'm not talking about software and systems in terms of their reliability, because this is we're actually getting better at this. This is a system that's obviously failed. But I'm talking about things that are a little bit grayer, that, that things that are actually working, but they're not working well. They're, they're actually meeting specifications, but they're not, they're not effective in terms of the patients or the, the providers. Use. Does anyone recognize this user interface? Oh, this is a young audience. This, is, this was my first computer interface. It's a, a command line, and anyone who still uses Unix uses the command line. And let's face it, the user interface of this is pretty crude. There was a steep learning curve, and it was not accessible to a majority of the people. Come on, hands up. How many people have recognized this? Okay, just a smattering. Okay. Um, some of you won't recognize this device either. A few of you? So this was a, an innovative device. This was a revolution in terms of a pocket computer. It's the first Palm device. A lot of people bought this device. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't buy a second device. 
Any reason why people didn't buy a second Palm device? Well, why wouldn't they have bought a second device if it was such an innovation? I think the user doesn't like that. Why? Because it's very inconvenient. What, what was inconvenient about it? How did you input data into this, this thing? There's no keyboard. Stylus, but you know, more than just the stylus is you had to learn how to, how to do this. Remember graffiti? Again, this is a very young audience. This is late 90s, but graffiti is you had to relearn how to do the characters. And that's a lot to ask of people, a lot to ask. So a lot of people just, and I saw some physicians actually get very quick at this, but it was, it was quite a burden. Human factors can be quite serious as well in terms of it, the implications of, of not um, being able to address uh, the design of systems. Does anybody notice, uh, does anybody know what this picture is? This is the Ukraine in 1986. This is Chernobyl. And it was probably one of the biggest human factors catastrophes in the world. But at first it was attributable to uh, user error that the engineers who were uh, monitoring the plant did not notice that the plant was going to go super critical and overheat. You know, this is the one of the worst nuclear uh, disasters in, in uh, the last 25, 30 years, um, perhaps even including the incident in Japan. Um, but the implications were, were very serious. It wasn't until a few years later that it was realized that those engineers did not have a chance there was no way they could determine that that plant was going to be overheating. You, they would have had to be physically located in three different parts of the plant, looking at three different panels to make the determination. It was physically impossible for them to do it. But the plant was designed to specifications, but it was not a usable system. So, you know, it's been more than 25 years now, and that region is still living with the effects of Chernobyl. And Three Mile Island, again, another nuclear incident that in, in, uh, in the U.S. that, again, was attributable to human factors issues. And even in the military, um, this device that was used in the Afghanistan war, so these are the, this is the U.S. Army, Army using this device. What they didn't know, or what they perhaps forgot in their training, is that this device defaults to your current location when you change the batteries. So in the heat of battle, they called in their own location and they bombed themselves, right? So three of the soldiers were killed, 17 injured, right? Tragic, uh, but what's even perhaps uh, more tragic is the reaction for the Air Force in, def in their defense. They, this is what their position, we have a serious training problem that needs to be corrected. We need to know how our equipment works when the battery is changed, it defaults to its own location. We've got to make sure our people understand this. So totally blaming the user and not the technology. Now I ask you, in retrospect, a technology that is used for calling in bomb strikes, when would you ever want that to ever default to your current location? Right? You would want that, like maybe just default to, I don't know, somewhere in the South Pacific or something, but never ever. And this is what I am talking about in terms of the lack of empathy in the design of technology is that if those engineers who designed that product ever you know, were in the boots of, a, of a, a U.S. soldier in Afghanistan, perhaps they would have the empathy in understanding what it meant to design technology that was so critical. There are even political implications to the design. So some of you may not know, but in the 2000 U.S. election, Joe would know this, this is the famous butterfly ballot. So some of you know Al Gore, some of you know George W. Bush. They were actually the Republican and Democratic candidates that year. It was down to one state. Whoever won the state of Florida won the election, became the 43rd president of the United States. Um, if you wanted to vote for Al Gore, which hole would you punch? Anybody? Which hole? Okay, so in order to vote for the second candidate listed, you would punch hole number five, which is the third one down. Make any sense? It's confusing, right? So what happened is that they got 17,000 ballots that both the second and third hole was punched. What's that about? That's a person making, realizing that they're making a mistake 
and repunching the hole. What happens to a ballot that has two holes punched in it? It's thrown out. Al Gore lost the election by 537 votes. Okay? So, you know, human factors does have an implication. And even something as, the, as the simple as the design of a ballot. So I ask you, what would have happened if Al Gore had become the 43rd president of the United States instead of George W. Bush? Anyway, this is a Korean audience. I don't think it necessarily <laughs> matters. It affects Canadians, I can tell you that. <laughs> but let's move on to simple things that can be done with the design of a pill bottle. Look at the disaster that are, is pill bottles with all kinds of phone numbers and marketing information and um, it's actually surprising that there's not a, more incidents related to uh, medication errors for patients. And, uh, you know, even the top of, of the, these, they're entirely inconsistent and not very helpful when you're looking at lots of them from above. And, you know, you look at this and, and there was a graduate student, a design student, who actually took it upon herself to try to just make some simple changes to the design of a pill bottle to see what would happen. And this is what she came up with. She came up with a color coding system here for different members of the family. She made the, the name of the drug most more prominent. She had it printed on the top. Uh, she made the instructions the most prominent. She made the information about the pharmacy the least prominent. She had these cautions printed on one side, very simple little things. And you know, these, the simple effort of one designer improved this. And now Target in the US uses these, this design in their, in their um, in their medication uh, uh, bottles here. And, you know, she in fact got it into the, uh, the MoMA uh, gallery for an exhibit in terms of innovation and design. So we really need to change the way we view technology uh, with this notion that back in the 1930s, this was the slogan in, in the Chicago World's Fair, science find, industry applies, and man conforms. That is so wrong by today's standards. Because this technology is created by us. This is what it should be, what Don Norman said it was, people propose science studies and technology conforms. And it's, it's a frame of mind, it's, it's something that you have to get your head wrapped around. Um, but then the work needs to be done, and unfortunately it's not that easy, right? It's much easier to just create a technology and hope to, for the best that people will be able to adapt to it. Um, and it is probably the hardest thing we do is trying to create technologies that are truly usable using this method that we talked about in terms of this iterative process. One of the examples that we did in the early days um, of our lab was our, one of our clients, Smith's Medical, asked us to help with this uh, PCA pump, a pain pump. And it took us three and a half years, and that's not uh, atypical with the design of a medical device, and 12 iterations. And this is a, a small ambulatory infusion pump. And uh, again, the challenge was that the first iteration of this pump was going to be used by, by providers, but the next iteration would also be used by patients in the home. So we needed to really have a robust design. And uh, you can see here that we're designing the software well before even the hardware is even created. And these nurses are trying to program the pump on this virtual version of the software probably at least three years before the pump was fully realized. Uh, again, extensive testing in our usability labs, uh, you know, 12 iterations of usability testing, time after time making sure that we get this right, largely because this, this thing delivers narcotics in, in many cases, right? We looked at things as, such as the latch design, uh, the design of the battery hatch, because it was very difficult for older patients to open that battery hatch up with, with a single hand. Uh, the screen design in terms of the automation and the, the workflow around, around the screen design. Um, and again, uh, the final testing uh, where we did lots of iterations was actually getting patients to use the pump itself. And this is the Solus VIP, which again is, is built for patients. And, uh, you know, after three and a half years, it went on to become uh, Smith's most uh, successful product, and it's used all around the world. And patients, uh, again, this is the way this patient's wearing it in, a, in an ambulatory sense, but patients do take this home. We do some work for nurses, and I think there's some nurses in the audience, right? So I think some of you nurses have probably had the task of doing vital signs, and you might do it a lot neater here in Korea. 
But this is what it, the way a Canadian nurse does it. Okay, so I don't know if you can make any sense out of these vital signs, but it's uh, really quite shocking. Um, but you know, there, there's a time factor here. They're very rushed. They do the best they can in terms of documenting vital signs. But we wanted to do this electronically for a couple of reasons, largely because we wanted to be able to alert the, the ICU or the rapid response teams in case something was going wrong with these patients. And in order to do that, we need to get into electronic form. So one of my graduate students took it upon herself to create a point of care iPhone application to be able to capture this. And what she really, her main objective was to get this into the realm of as the speed of being able to do this on paper. Pen and paper is very efficient. It's very fast. She just wanted to get close. So again, lots of um, study and usability testing and iterations and creating an application that had uh, that was at least close to being close to uh, close to being uh, comparable to paper and pen. Now you can see here logging in, um, uh, choosing the patient. Now some of this is pretty simple in terms of data entry, uh, blood pressure. One of the things that was really difficult was respiration rate because nurses don't like doing respiration rate because how do you do it? You have to watch the patient's uh, chest wall and count, and then you have to multiply and so on. So she came up with a very clever way of dealing with this, is you just watch the patient's chest wall and you tap every time you see them breathe. You just watch and tap, watch and tap, and you're gonna, not gonna do any calculations, you just watch and tap, and it will calculate it for you. It will calculate the intervals between, and you're done. So that one parameter that nurses hated to do is probably perhaps more efficient here on an electronic form than anything else. And again, what we wanted to do was, was create a system, an automated system that from the data that was collected, the rapid response teams would be automatically alerted using early warning scores. So now turning to patient self-care. So I started in on this around 2000 when I met um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Chris Chan, who's the head of nephrology. And he was, um, you know, he, he spent his entire career dealing with uh, patients with end-stage renal disease. And uh, this was a, an important thing for me because my father also had end-stage renal disease at, this, at the time. And I was really intrigued by, about what uh, Dr. Chan was contemplating is he was thinking about sending patients home with a dialysis machine. Not a peritoneal dialysis machine, a hemodialysis machine. Peritoneal dialysis has been in the home for many years, but to bring that big machine home was meant uh, huge implications because the supplies had to be brought, had, a truck had to pull up to this patient's home every couple of weeks with dialysate and all those supplies. The plumbing had to be installed in the patient's home, specialized plumbing, and they had to learn how to use the machine. And I don't know if any of you specialize in nephrology, but in Canada it takes two years to specialize in neph nephrology. He wanted to train these, these patients in six weeks how to, how to use these machines. He also wanted to do, uh, again, one of the consequences of doing home hemodialysis is self-cannulate. And I don't know, even still to this day, and it's been 13 years later, as I still don't understand how these patients can, can manage to self-cannulate two needles of that size every single day, but they do it. Um, and, you know, a lot of these, the motivation is very young women who, who really want to do this. These are the, the first three women who gave uh, birth to children. Um, who were on home hemodialysis, Yvonne Maffey, Marie Saginot, and Bella Agarwal. Um, and they had a great motivation because in, in end-stage renal disease, you only have about 2% chance of conceiving and even less of a chance of bringing that pregnancy to term. It's, it's a really awful thing to be in your 20s and, and contemplating a life of not being able to start a family. So they were highly motivated because theoretically, on home hemodialysis, they would have the ability to get more dialysis Instead of uh, you know, three days a week, four hours, they would be able to get six or seven hours every single day at home doing it overnight. And sure enough, these women were successful, as were dozens of other women. So at Toronto General, there are dozens and dozens of children now born to women who previously would not have had the ability to um, bring these pregnancies to bear. And Chris Chan, over the last decade, has shown a huge number of benefits for patients doing this you know, extreme form of self-care. I don't even know what else you could do, a patient could do beyond this in terms of self-care, except maybe performing surgery on themselves. I don't, can't think of anything else. It's so invasive. 
Um, and also, great patient autonomy. We saw patients going back to work, going back to school, and it's even less costly to do home hemodialysis than to do it in center. Why? Because the biggest cost of, of hemodialysis is nursing care. And the patient, in a large sense now, has reduced the nursing ratio from about 2 to 1, 3 to 1, to 20 to 1 now in home hemodialysis. It's not without its, its downside. You know, the patients that are on home hemodialysis, and we have about 150 patients now in, in uh, Toronto General doing home hemodialysis. Uh, the study that I did with uh, Chris Chan is I tried to find out why people might not want to do home hemodialysis. And you can imagine the impact on patients. Uh, this whole thing about self-cannulation. What, what happens if something terrible happens in the middle of the night? It's this fear of catastrophic events. And this low self-efficacy was a big one because many of the patients that we were talking to had already been on dialysis for a number of years. And look at the daunting task. Look at the daunting task of them, you know, coming in three days a week. They see how complicated dialysis is. And there's not a lot of appetite to do it. And that includes my father. You know, I asked him uh, whether or not he would co uh, contemplate hemodialysis. And, you know, even though he's actually, you know, was very mechanically inclined, very good with his hands, you know, I, I, I'd like to think I got some of those skills from him. He said, no way. Th these machines were not built for the home. They're too complicated. I'm not doing it. And I totally understand. I totally understand. But it is frustrating for me because as an engineer, I'm, again, embarrassed at how overly complicated and unnecessarily complicated the dialysis technology is. In fact, this knob on this dialysis machine, which simply adjusts the blood flow, right? So adjusting it from 100 milliliters an hour, a minute to 300 milliliters, that, that knob, that meter right there, that is, uh, is labeled a potentiometer. And, um, I don't know if you know what the potentiometer is. I don't know what the Korean word for potentiometer is, but it's an electrical engineering term, and it's, that's the definition of it. And it's totally ridiculous to put something like that in a manual, but it is. Um, and again, it's another example of engineers sort of designing for engineers and not thinking about uh, patients or having any empathy for the patients. And for the nurses, I might add. I don't think any nurse could appreciate this notion of, of anything labeled as a potentiometer. So, you know, these women, uh, were successful despite the technology was given them. We tried to do the best we could and set, set, up, set them up for success. And you know, there's these, these extreme cases as well. This fellow in China, in rural China, Hu Song Wen, about six months ago, he, this, he, it was publicized that about 20 years ago he went on dialysis and after six years his entire life savings was depleted because and he just spent every single dollar that his family had on, hemo, on hemodialysis. So he, he had really no other choice, but he decided to build his own dialysis machine for the last 13 years. Uh, he's been doing dialysis at home with his homemade dialysis machine. The only component that he bought was this $500 pump, uh, but the rest of it is uh, jury rigged, and he's been doing this successfully for the last 13 years. His 82-year-old mother helps him uh, with the treatments uh, every other day. And the Chinese government was a bit embarrassed about this and offered him free dialysis service, but it was too far and he was doing fine, so he continues on his home hemodialysis. Uh, again, these guys are outliers, but my point is that um, there's lots of patients out there who are willing to do incredible things, and if we only gave them a chance, they, 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 would, they would be able to do that. And I'm not talking about something as extreme as hemodialysis, but what if we gave them access to their personal health information? What if we gave them tools to manage their care more effectively? And that's the point I want to make, is that if, if the home hemodialysis is probably one of the most extreme examples of self-care, we can do a whole lot more with other less serious conditions, chronic conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and so on. And so that brings me to... Um, the first group that we sort of contemplated um, doing a diabetes application is uh, adolescents. And our colleagues at the Hospital for Sick Kids warned us about this, saying that this is a very difficult group, really difficult group. And, um, you know, because they don't do what they're told. And, and it took me a while to appreciate this, but until I had my own teenager. And uh, this, is, uh, this is another Cafazo. This is Aiden Cafazo. 
And look how happy he is to be with his father in Piccadilly Circus in London last summer, right? He's so happy. Um, so I can appreciate, I can't imagine, Aiden is perfectly healthy other than being a bit surly. Um, he, uh, but he has no chronic illness. I can't imagine if he had a chronic illness such as type 1 diabetes. I, I just don't know how parents manage. Um, my cousin has this, uh, a young daughter who's approaching, um, she has type 1 diabetes, has been diagnosed uh, several years ago. And uh, she's approaching adolescence, and she's already starting. She's an excellent patient now, but she's already starting to grow this fatigue around diabetes. And she doesn't want uh, all the, you know, again, the, the fatigue of just having to think about her condition uh, every day uh, for the rest of her life. So, you know, one of the things that these kids hate to do is the self-monitoring of blood sugars, which is critical. And uh, it's, you know, obviously there's a finger prick. Um, there's this, this technology which is not very cool, it's not especially for teenagers. It's not something that you want to pull out at the lunch table. Uh, it's quite embarrassing for them, for many of them. So we wanted to do something that was a bit fun for, for kids with type of diabetes. We created this, this application called BANT. Um, we wanted to incorporate um, social media into it, connect them with other kids or other people with type 1 diabetes. Um, this is what the application looks like. The first edition uh, supported a, um, a PHR such as Google Health and Microsoft Health Vault. Um, again, it had an easy way of entering data. We eventually automated that. We had this our own private uh, Twitter-like feed in the community. And we also made it multilingual, which was very important in order to get this global market because there's lots of people out there with diabetes. So we've had about 80,000 downloads of BANT over the, the last couple of years, and we have about 10,000 people who use it every day. And um, this is the stats, uh, US number one, Korea's number two. Uh, Italy's number four. Uh, those are interesting statistics because that's sort of disproportionate to populations. But at the time we took this, we realized that there was no other diabetes app in, in the Korean language. So. And I'm, I'm sure there probably are now, but, but that's how important localization is. is the same thing in, in Italian, there was no Italian applications. By simply localizing your app makes a big difference in terms of the numbers. One of the things the kids wanted is these fast, discrete co connections. They wanted to be in and out of these applications. This is, again, before we created BANT, we needed to find out what, what would really click with these kids. And, you know, there's these cable connections to glucometers. Uh, and we tried this um, a number of years ago, and uh, the kids didn't like it because it was too many steps. It was this, this you know, it, it was just, it wasn't really that convenient to carry around an extra cable. Um, as well, there's, you know, there's these devices now, IBG Star, which has been out for a couple years. Unfortunately, it's already obsolete because there's no 30-pin connector on the new devices. So we went to the trouble of creating this Bluetooth adapter. So it takes uh, data from the serial connector of your glucometer and transmits it wirelessly. And our industrial designers uh, try to spend some time figuring out how to hide this Bluetooth adapter so that it wasn't too kludgy. And really what we're trying to achieve is something that is very quick and discreet that people don't really notice that it's there. And what we got is that they really don't uh, need to do anything that they don't do normally. They take their blood sample, they apply it, uh, they pull the strip, which activates the Bluetooth uh, adapter, which transmits over to the phone and launches BANT automatically. And then the, the data is transferred very quickly, you know, pretty instantaneously, and they're done. And that's how quick it needed to be in order for these kids to use it. If it took a couple of minutes and logins and all this kind of things, we knew that we were in trouble. So BANT incorporated in its first iteration this, this Twitter-like feed where the kids who were enrolled in the study could communicate which, with each other. Interestingly, they didn't talk about diabetes, and we didn't really care as long as they used the application on a regular basis. We gamified it. We created a rewards program where they earned experience points for every reading they took. They get uh, a, a double points for their lunch reading. They get uh, a further uh, bonus for taking five readings in a day, which is sort of the minimum that we want them to take. And they, they accumulate these points, uh, level up, and then they can redeem them for iTunes redemption code. So it's gamification and some incentives. And they redeem them for all kinds of things. Uh, they bought music. 
Uh, they bought apps like such as Angry Birds Rio here, and this person bought Night Vision Picture and Video Spy Toolbox Pro. All kinds of things. And the end result after about three months, this, is, this was just a, a small pilot, is that we showed that they increased their, uh, their frequency of, uh, um, of measurements by almost 50% on a daily basis. This is compared to the three months previous when they weren't using BANT. So they, uh, a significant improvement. And, and as Joe Kavidar mentioned in, his pre, in the previous presentation that, you know, uh, what we hope to see is that this increase in self-monitoring blood glucose will actually result in improvement in the hemoglobin A1C. And that's when we're actually doing a, a trial, an RCT now underway, and we hope to see an improvement in, in glycemic control. So this is the next version of BANT, which is under this RCT. Uh, it's an, it's a, a, a new interface. We now have this new social media uh, tab called Banter, and it's all been refreshed in terms of its design, and it has um, new features in terms of the social media uh, aspect. It has this trend wizard, which is able to detect high readings and be able to walk them through what the cause and the fix will be. And really, we added a lot in terms of the gamification. It's a lot more sophisticated in terms of what you could earn in terms of points. And it also has a leaderboard because what we found is that the kids were quite competitive. They would use the community, the social media feed, in order to compare points. And now they don't need to do that. They have a leaderboard, and they can see how they rank against their, their colleagues. Um, and you can, you can see how you're doing today, this weekend, for all time, and see how you're ranked amongst the other kids uh, participating in the trial. And again, you are able to track your progress and you can see how many points you need before you get your, your uh, level up to the next level and, and redeem your, your points. Also, uh, we are going to be supporting more devices that integrate directly into the phone. Unfortunately, the diabetes uh, manufacturers are extremely conservative and there's actually no commercially available Bluetooth uh, glucometers on the market right now. We, we hope to see one within the next year from one manufacturer. There might be two within the next two years, but it's very, very slow. So I have a, a couple of colleagues that are working on a, uh, a, the, the type one version. I have a graduate student who's working on a type two version, and I actually have a, a student who's working on a, the artificial pancreas version. And just to briefly tell you what that is, is that we're trying to build a platform that allows for the continuous monitoring of blood glucose using a CGM, using the smartphone to have the control algorithm that, that, that controls the insulin pump directly. This is actually a shot from a trial at Mass General. This was the state of the art about 18 months ago, and UVA, University of Virginia, has already produced a version on an Android phone that is actually looks as, as small as that that's running off of an Android phone. So we have a grant from JDRF. We're working with literally hundreds of other researchers from all around the world to, to move towards this thing of an autonomous uh, artificial pancreas that hopefully will be realized within the next five years. So that is BANT. And a little bit of history for you, in case you didn't know where the origins of the name BANT came from. It came from a, a famous uh, Canadian physician at the University of Toronto who, um, this was a letter from uh, a mother in Saskatchewan who was desperate. She heard in, in 1922 that someone had found uh, a cure for diabetes in Toronto and she didn't know the name of the doctor and she just simply wrote this on a letter and sent it off to the doctor who cures diabetes. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't a cure, but it was a treatment for diabetes, and that was the discovery of insulin, which was Frederick Banting back in 1921, and that's where the name Bant comes from. Um, moving on to blood pressure measurements. Another application that we did, um, this time on a BlackBerry, Bluetooth-enabled blood pressure monitor. In our initial trial, we saw improvements using the mobile app that we created. Uh, but this was just a pilot. What we really want to do is a randomized control trial. So we gave one group the blood pressure monitor, the other group our app with a Bluetooth-enabled blood pressure monitor, and we followed up after a year. No change in the group uh, that just used the blood pressure monitor. No significant change. We saw this 20% uh, decrease in cardiovascular mortality with the group that had the mobile health app. The other great thing was no additional meds, no additional visits to the family doctors. And, you know, Joe Kavidar mentioned the Sentinel effect, that this was certainly the case here, is that these reminders, these, these automated reminders uh, 
created uh, this mechanism where they felt that they had to start taking their blood pressure measurements, these reminders. And it was in the voice of their family doctor, which I think was important. They were, they were pre-recorded. And quite frankly, the family doctors did not see this data, but there's a sense that they were being watched. It's kind of like the cutout of the, the police officer. Uh, they didn't know how real it was, but at least you know they got this this voice of authority over the phone if they stopped taking their measurements. And it's clearly enough, you know, that was one of the mechanisms that was working there. That this you created this self awareness. Eventually, you start uh, realizing that yes, you know, despite the fact that I don't have any symptoms, I should be taking my my blood pressure medication on a regular basis. And that's how we got the medication adherence. Another application was 30 days. The Heart and Stroke Foundation wanted a simple app for the general public just to get people to start thinking about their risk of heart attack and stroke and we created this app called 30 days which takes you through a series of questions it assesses you for the risk of heart attack and stroke and then on a daily basis it prompts you with a, a, a challenge uh, every single day to, to you know don't eat um, don't eat meat today, why don't you try fish instead? Why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you cl climb the stairs to your office instead of taking the elevator? Little challenges throughout the day in order for you to be more self-aware. And again, again, we gamified it. Um, and we did this in a very short period of time. They wanted it out in three, th uh, three months. And they got 70,000 downloads in two months. They, they really did a great job at marketing this application. And I, I think this point, I, I tried this application myself and it's really hard to, to maintain because it's all constantly asking you to do these little things. But we were really impressed that at least 6,000 people of those 70,000 people stuck it out for the entire 30 days and finished the program. Uh, when we were asked to do an asthma application, I gave my, um, my, one of my designers, Cassie, this, this uh, notion of that we really needed to build a consumer application for asthma, something not like anything else that was already on the market. She spent a lot of time doodling on ideas. She came up with the name Breathe and, and this brand. And we spent uh, probably two or three months designing the application before we wrote any line of code. No programmers were involved until we understood where we were heading with this application. And these were some of the, the concepts and the polish that we were getting. Uh, Breathe uh, is now in a random, randomized control trial. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the polish of these applications because they are truly consumer applications alongside Subway Surfer and Facebook and Angry Birds. You can see that Bant in 30 days and Breathe, they live amongst these other applications. And, you know, patients aren't going to give us uh, a discount because it's a healthcare app. They're not going to give us the benefit of the doubt and, and forgive us if it's not as good as YouTube or Subway Surfer or Facebook. Um, you know, we're competing for the attention of an individual. And we need to have the same standards as those applications as well. So it's a real tall order. And, you know, I'm very grateful for the, the time my, my staff takes in terms of the polish on those applications. In the end, uh, when working with our respirologists and our family doctors, we came up with the notion that, that it would be an application for the tracking and reminders of, of taking your puffers on a regular basis, trend analysis. It actually pulls a data from Environment Canada to warn you about environmental factors that might affect your asthma. Um, and it was our first responsive design application. It will run on many platforms. Uh, it's, it's a web app. And uh, I really would like to see this out into the general public because we're, we're very proud of it. But unfortunately, right now, it's, it's held up as a randomized control trial, but we're trying to work uh, with our partners to get this out to the general public. One of the things that we're working on now, which we'll see the light of day in, in about three or four years, is this notion of using on-body sensors. This is a, an ECG patch. Our partners in the Netherlands at IMEC have designed the electronics for it. <clears throat> it's a very simple device. It looks like a giant Band-Aid, and you apply it to the skin, and it's an ECG patch, um, but it will last for days. It will transmit ECG for days and days and days because it uses ultra-low power electronics. Uh, this is what it looks like on the inside, and we created an application that obviously displays ECG, uh, but we can also get it all kinds of applications that weren't previously possible, like being able to measure your stress over the long term by using a technique called heart rate variability. So that's um, something that's coming in the next few years for us. The one uh, last trial that I want to talk about is um, my colleague Emily Cito. 
who just decided to try to, put, to stick a heart failure client on a mobile phone, something as simple as a flip uh, BlackBerry. And that's a lot because there's lots of data coming in. Heart, heart failure is not like just hypertension or, or, or diabetes. There's multiple parameters. There's a blood pressure and so on, multiple parameters. And uh, what she did is she asked her, the patients in her trial before 10 a.m. to take their weight, um, take their blood pressure, do a single EDCG, and a answer a series of yes or no questions. And as simple as that, uh, before 10 a.m. every morning. And if something was uh, gone awry, if there was an exception, it would go to the cardiologist on call or the nurse practitioner on call. So the patients really liked the system because it was very simple to use. You, you, know, you sort of step on the scale and everything just happens for you. You take the blood pressure. The, the cardiologists liked it just because they had this, this feeling of security uh, around their patients, that, that they knew that their patients were safer. And over the course of six months, she did an RCT with 100 patients. And she saw these improvements, brain natriuretic peptide improved by 150 points, left and ventricular ejection fraction improved by 7.4%, self-care by seven points, and no change in the control group. So again, just a few examples of apps that we've created in mHealth through the use of empathy and design. Just remember, my, my, what I ask of you is just think about this. Think about patients like Yvonne Maffey who she's, you know, I think she's an extremely brave woman, but I don't think she was exceptional. She just was put in the circumstances. She was given choices. We tried to make the best of her situation, and she took the, the leap. There's lots of patients out there. This is her now with her two children. She's taken her name off the transplant list. She's doing fine on hemodialysis. She's nearly 40 years old, and she's doing great. Uh, I got to thank my team, my team of engineers. Uh, but most importantly, the Healthcare Human Factors Group, which is a group of 20, 25 now if you include the graduate students. And uh, they're the ones who really uh, put a lot of pressure on us to make really truly usable um, and, and you know, products, systems that people really want to use. And here we are in the midst of Toronto General Hospital and, and downtown Toronto, very close to the university. That relationship has been great over the years. Thank you very much.